video conference uh, on uh, uh, non-proliferation nuclear disarmament. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm uh, very thrilled to have uh, such an impressive panel. Uh, I'm also uh, very excited to have uh, 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 other friends, uh, researchers, colleagues, uh, experts, uh, most importantly, young generation, uh, young people from Kazakhstan and the United Kingdom joining us at this webinar to discuss this uh, very uh, important topic. Uh, we have, uh, of course, been uh, all uh, influenced by the pandemic in different ways, uh, but definitely uh, there are certain advantages uh, in, in having uh, this experience of uh, having the video uh, events. Uh, otherwise, it would be extremely difficult to imagine to uh, physically gather uh, all these distinguished uh, panelists and experts uh, um, we have uh, keynote speakers, uh, panelists, uh, Foreign Minister Irjan Ashikbaev uh, from Kazakhstan. Uh, we have our great friend uh, Lasino Zerbo, uh, Executive Secretary. Uh, he was recently uh, awarded uh, a special uh, distinguished prize uh, last year, uh, together with uh, Yuki Amano. He was awarded uh, by the special uh, uh, nuclear disarmament prize uh, uh, of uh, the president of Kazakhstan. Uh, we have uh, our, uh, Ambassador Aidan Lidl. Ambassador, I wonder whether, uh, uh, do you know that uh, Aidan is a very Kazakh name? So I'm very uh, happy <laughs> that you have this great Kazakh name. He is joining, his ambassador is the permanent representative of the United Kingdom uh, to uh, the conference on disarmament in Geneva. He's joining us from Geneva. Unfortunately, Cardinal Peter Turkson uh, couldn't join us today, but he is being uh, helped uh, by uh, one of his colleagues uh, uh, from uh, Vatican. Let me uh, greet uh, Lord Hanev Chizik, uh, uh, a distinguished uh, politician, uh, uh, a figure known uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, he has an extensive uh, career uh, in diplomacy. We have uh, Kate Hudson, Secretary General uh, of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, joining us from London. Kate, hello. Uh, my old friend, uh, a good friend, uh, Vladimir Skolnik, a nuclear physicist, uh, uh, a, a longest serving minister in the government of Kazakhstan. He, it, actually, it's easier to uh, uh, name the ministries he didn't have. Uh, during his uh, impressive career. Uh, he is now the chairman uh, of the uh, Kazakhstan Pagos Movement Committee. And of course, uh, we have Peter Jenkins, uh, our uh, friend uh, from uh, the Pagos uh, uh, group uh, of the United Kingdom. Uh, let me uh, once again welcome everyone uh, to this uh, important uh, video event. Uh, a few organizational matters. Uh, we, uh, two keynote speakers, uh, Deputy Minister and uh, uh, Vasina will have 10 minutes each uh, for their remarks. Uh, other panelists will have uh, seven minutes uh, for their remarks. At the end of uh, uh, presentations, we'll have a question and answer session, which will be moderated by my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Plesh, uh, who is uh, 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 very generously uh, giving his time to join us uh, here in the embassy. We are sitting in the embassy, and I'm very happy that we have this hybrid type of uh, video event. We we physically here in London together with Dr. Plesh. Uh, I, uh, I want to tell that we have the live stream on our embassy's uh, Facebook. Um, so without uh, much ado, uh, let me uh, uh, tell that uh, pandemic, uh, of course, has uh, caused uh, uh, lots of uh, changes in our lives. Uh, uh, it has caused uh, serious uh, um, impacts on the political systems. Uh, uh, in different countries of the world, but more importantly, it is also uh, putting to test the uh, multilateral system, international uh, relations system. Uh, some uh, see the elements or signs of uh, fragmentation uh, in the world, uh, but uh, we do want to hope that uh, pandemic uh, and uh, all um, the uh, challenges it carries uh, will uh, encourage all, all of us uh, to uh, enhance on the country uh, our uh, joint efforts to uh, uh, 
to maintain peace and uh, make the world uh, much safer to live in. Of course, uh, uh, this nuclear disarmament is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, on global agenda. Therefore, um, we are happy to have this uh, event. Uh, this, is, uh, this event is dedicated to the International Day uh, Against Nuclear Tests announced by the United Nations. And at the same time, uh, we celebrate today the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Um, since we have uh, some limits uh, on our time, I uh, wanted to uh, go straight into business. Before we go into business, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, give the floor for introduction uh, to uh, Dr. Plesh. Then we'll have a short video and then uh, we'll start our uh, video event. Well, yes. thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's a, a great honor and pleasure to uh, be working with you here today. And we've worked uh, successfully um, uh, with the government of Kazakhstan for for some years. Uh, well, here we are uh, just back from holidays, some of us, or just emerging from uh, isolation. Um, in the last century, uh, late August, uh, September was quite a good time for uh, starting world war. Um, so perhaps we can have a little uh, counter dynamic to uh, uh, assist world peace uh, by uh, getting together in, in early September. I think our motivation for wanting to work together and uh, organize this today rather than in some months time was a sense of uh, real urgency uh, that the, even before the impact of, of COVID, the global situation um, with the sort of nuclear Damocles holding, hanging over us uh, had become extraordinarily dangerous. And in bullet points, as many of us I think are aware, that the lessons learned at so much great cost in two world wars, uh, resulting in the creation of the United Nations and international system and arms control, had more or less willfully been thrown away in the last decade or two, um, creating a situation far too like that of the late 19th century for anyone's comfort. And that in that context, we see rising international rivalry between members of the Security Council uh, we saw the still unresolved economic dislocation of the, uh, of the financial crash, the uh, accelerating uh, dislocations and disasters of climate change, and into this uh, witch's brew, we now have this further um, spice, if you like, evil spice of, of COVID. And I fear that the unfolding uh, medical, social, political impact of that is just uh, even now gathering momentum. Um, not something which we're looking towards the end of, but which we are, if not in the overture, perhaps into the, uh, the first uh, section of a gruesome symphony uh, that is evolving. And the impact of this on security um, with uh, almost no efforts at control in uh, the field of armaments and particularly nuclear armaments is I think frankly moving us into uh, what can now be called a pre-war situation and what do we have to do in that to change the dynamics and that is partly what we're about today it's uh, what we uh, work at in our uh, organization with a number of partners uh, with the Vatican and others to think about a strategic concept for uh, removing uh, weapons of all kinds, not just nuclear, which is, of course, a, a key priority. Uh, and to think, well, on the verification side, what can we do in the age of Google Earth? Weapons transparency and security through confidence building measures should be much more practically to hand than it would appear to be. And that is a second of our, uh, of our efforts. And uh, a number of people have supported the idea that, as the Holy Father says, now is not the time to be producing more weapons. The freeze was an idea used with some effect in the Cold War, uh, particularly in nuclear testing. Uh, the Soviet Union, the United States almost became a, had a virtual, virtuous competition of uh, moratoria or freezes on nuclear testing. And so partly what we suggest towards the uh, UN Disarmament Day in October is uh, to think again about having a, a freeze on uh, weapons uh, production and, and deployment. Uh, not, I think, out of uh, moral 
uh, reasons, although those are powerful, but really out of a sense of the necessity of survival. Uh, that uh, the idea of deterrence is one, many would say, has kept the peace. Others would say we have survived by luck. I would tend to the latter, to the latter view. So that is our context, I think. And uh, to bring it back to the question, uh, I would say it isn't so much a chance to achieve a nuclear weapon free world, but unless we work towards that, frankly, we know have no chance uh, that we are in a dead end of policy, a literal dead end. And uh, working towards that goal and broader efforts on weapons control is simply a matter of personal survival. And Ken President Kennedy was not the first or the last to say that unless we abolish war, war is going to abolish us. And the dynamics that we've seen accelerating in the last decade are indeed gruesome. And COVID is just accelerating these factors. So with that, um, uh, perhaps less than diplomatic, um, Creed Kerr, uh, I'll ha uh, hand back to uh, Your Excellency, and I'm not sure if you wanted to introduce the, the video or bring in... Yeah, the, let, the let, uh, thank you. Thank you for your remarks, uh, opening remarks. Uh, let's have a short video, and after that, uh, Dan will introduce uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Shibayev. On August 29, 1949, the former Soviet Union detonated what would be the first of more than 450 nuclear warheads at their new testing site in eastern Kazakhstan. Just 100 miles away, the people in the industrial city of Semipalatinsk watched as the sky lit up and radiation filled the air. Today, that city is called Semi. Over the four decades of nuclear tests, approximately 1.5 million people in the region were affected. Today, one in 20 children is born with deformities. The cancer rate is 50% higher here than elsewhere in the country. Many of the population die before reaching 60. Some countries, such as Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Belarus, and South Africa, have already eliminated their nuclear weapons or abandoned their nuclear weapons programs. Through the decisions of its president, Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan has also shut down the infamous semi palatinsk nuclear test site. Yet other countries could have done much more to help create a nuclear safe world. The United Nations is working to build national and global security without nuclear weapons establish regional nuclear weapons free zones, put an end to testing, and ultimately free the world of its nuclear arsenal. One of the most concrete steps towards achieving this goal would be pushing through the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The very existence and availability of weapons grade fissile material in nuclear states such as North Korea, as well as the appeal of nuclear devices as the ultimate weapon, increase the risk of global nuclear terrorism. If we stop nuclear weapons testing and secure all fissile material, then we also substantially reduce the threat of nuclear terrorism. To realize the world free of nuclear weapons is the top priority of the United Nations and most ardent aspiration of human beings. Here in semi Palatinsk, I call on other four nuclear weapon states to follow suit of Kazakhstan. Yes. Thank you very much for that uh, sobering um, note. So it's my great uh, pleasure to um, introduce the, the Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan, uh, Mr. Uh, Yazan uh, Ajik uh, Bayev. Uh, I must say, by way of introduction, that our relationship with the Kazakhstan uh, goes back to the time when now President Tukayev was um, uh, his role as Secretary General of the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva and uh, spoke out and was a very early supporter of our scrap project. So we're very happy to continue our relationship. 
and I'd now like to uh, hand over to if not the floor, the microphone, and the it's all on to uh, to the minister. So, great to see. Thank you. Uh, Right Honourable Lord Henry of Chiswick, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's uh, my great honour to join all of you uh, to mark the International Day Against Nuclear Test and uh, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Unfortunately, uh, our digital meeting is taking place in an extraordinary uh, circumstances uh, uh, the human toll from the disease has been terrific, uh, horrific. Our countries has been badly hit uh, by this pandemic. And uh, I would like to express my deep condolences to the families and friends of those who left this world and wish a speedy recovery to those who are still fighting this disease. And let me also uh, express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Plesh for hosting this event in partnership with uh, Ambassador Idrisov uh, and the Embassy of Kazakhstan. And of course, uh, I'm uh, happy to welcome all the panelists uh, to, and look forward to uh, very lively discussions. 2020 meant to be a special year, the year of 75th anniversary of the United Nations and 50th anniversary of the NPT's entry into force. Also this year, we mark the 35th anniversary of the Reagan Gorbachev principle, who jointly articulated at their 1985 summit, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And it is symbolic that current pandemic of COVID-19 had obscured an issue of nuclear disarmament and threatens our collective developmental gains in this field. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased the threat to global cooperation and enabled certain actors to utilize blame game and witch hand tactics. It also marked a new round of collision between globalism and nationalism by introducing an outdated culture of every man for himself into global politics. The situation in the field of uh, disarmament is critical. Unfortunately, the gap between the nuclear and non-nuclear communities is becoming increasingly wider. And we should definitely bring political trust and the systemic dialogue back to the international affairs. And we should recognize that uh, ultimately, it's nuclear powers that bear the highest responsibility to save the humanity from the global catastrophe. This year also marks the 75th anniversary of the first and uh, hopefully, hopefully the only use of a nuclear weapon in a war. Though the Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacks ended the World War II, they also set off a nuclear arms race. And we are now witnessing the signs of a second arms race. And the rhetorical question arises, has the world become a safer place to live? Well, uh, today's coronavirus tests uh, international relations for strength, both at the level of individual countries and multilateral organizations. This is a reminder of fragility of our world. In this regard, we wholeheartedly welcome the recent talks between the US and Russia in Vienna taking place uh, in these current difficult circumstances. We hope the negotiations will help restore bilateral dialogue and at least lead to the soonest extension of the new START treaty for the full five years. The issues of nuclear disarmament and arms control are closely intertwined with the history of my nation, Kazakhstan. Well, more than 2,000 nuclear tests were carried out worldwide and uh, well over 450 plus of them were carried out on the territory of Kazakhstan. So the closure of the semi palatins nuclear test site in August 9, 29, 1991, by the decision of the first president, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan, driven by the overwhelming support of the wider Kazakh public, played a pivotal role in the process of stalling nuclear tests and paved the way for a new global norm, banning testing with the approval of the CTBT in 1996. 
By voluntarily and completely renouncing its nuclear weapons arsenal, the fourth largest in the world at the time, in addition to closing the polygon, Kazakhstan showed the whole world an example of a responsible and decisive approach to preserving peace and humanity. Over the years, there have been calls to ban nuclear tests to ensure the protection of people's lives and environments around them. The CTBT was adopted in response uh, to growing political concern and public pressure on the issue of nuclear testing. Regrettably, almost 25 years after its inception, the CTBT has yet to enter into force due to the absence of number of ratifications. And I'm more than sure Dr. Zerbo, uh, our very good friend, will uh, definitely elaborate on, on that topic. The president of uh, Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamar Tokayev, being a staunch supporter of global nuclear disarmament, uh, has continued President Nazarbayev's anti-nuclear initiatives. In his first speech as the head of state at the UN General Assembly in 2019, he stressed that Nazarbayev's initiative to read completely the world of nuclear weapons by 2045 has already found a huge number of supporters, both among political leaders and the wider global community. Uh, Kazakhstan recently joined the uh, Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, which uh, in a sense represents a new reality and will be, rep will be representing a new legal reality, uh, we hope very soon after completing 50 needed ratifications. It's been it, it was a result of uh, stagnation of the design process. But Kazakhstan remains very much realistic and we also seek to work constructively with like-minded states uh, as well as nuclear weapon states through various initiatives. The SENT initiative, the Stepping Stones approach and the SCRAP. We will continue to maintain strategic partnerships with all nuclear powers, the UK, the EU, the United States, Russian Federation, China, and good relations with all other nations around the world, which will help building bridges and closing the gaps in positions on many critical issues, including the, this current one. We do hope that collective actions at the international level will make possible to find a way for a nuclear weapon free world. Uh, and even though I'm uh, personally I'm much more pessimistic uh, or realistic, I, I should say, than the speech uh, I was written by my colleagues, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, the least we can do is to continue our efforts uh, towards this noble goal. Uh, otherwise, we will be hearing to yet another recommendations uh, by the World Health Organization to wear uh, very different type of protective, personal protective equipment should we fail uh, to prevent uh, a nuclear accident or nuclear war. So uh, it's in the best interest of everyone in uh, the global community to achieve a nuclear weapons free world and to live uh, in a world with at least one danger of uh, uh, the danger of uh, nuclear annihilation being addressed and uh, being uh, solved. I thank you uh, for your kind attention and I very much look forward to uh, further interactions. Thank you. Yerjan, uh, for your uh remarks and uh, thank you for kicking off our discussion. Uh, without much ado, uh, let me uh, give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Lassina Zerbo, Executive Secretary of the CTBTO. Uh, as you know, he uh, was very uh, instrumental in cementing CTBTO's uh, position as the world's center of excellence uh, for nuclear test ban verification. And uh, he uh, gives his life uh, and uh, uh, all his efforts to uh, drive forward uh, 
uh, towards the entry into force and universalization of the CTBTO. CTBT. Uh, that's a, a huge, enormous task. Uh, we all know the challenges uh, which uh, the organization in the whole world faces in this respect, but uh, as Deputy Minister uh, Ashikbayev said, we should not uh, stop uh, in our perseverance of uh, uh, doing even little steps uh, to bring close to the world uh, free of nuclear weapons. Uh, Dr. Uh, Azerbo, you, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Idrisov and uh, dear friend uh, of, uh, Kaz from Kazakhstan. And uh, Excellency uh, Deputy Minister Ashikbayev uh, and my good friend, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, platform. Uh, Lord Hane, Excellencies, friends, uh, I was tempted to say partners in crime because it sounds like a crime to, to fight uh, for the hand of nuclear testing and uh, prepare for the world free of nuclear weapons. But anyway, we partners in this field, and then I want to thank you all the, for being uh, in, uh, on this platform. So it is indeed a pleasure to address uh, this important event, even if the virtual format reminds us that we have not yet reached the post-COVID era. So I wish to thank you, uh, Deputy Minister Ashibayev, along with His Excellency Ambassador Idrisov and his colleague in the Embassy of Kazakhstan for arranging this uh, discussion. Uh, Kazakhstan, uh, which suffered, as uh, many of you have mentioned already, uh, so much from nuclear testing in the site at uh, semi Palacing has taken this unfortunate legacy and transformed it into something positive and life-affirming. I guess this is a way to go because uh, Kazakhstan is basically turning something negative into positive. I think we have to do more of this, especially in this time. So Kazakhstan is perhaps the country with the strongest and the most persistent track record on advocating for the end to nuclear tests. Today's discussion takes place in the context of the International Day Again Nuclear Tests on 29 August the creation of which was led by Kazakhstan. Admits a global pandemic unprecedented in the modern age, the fact that we continue to mark the International Day Against Nuclear Tests provide us with a stark reminder that this issue is not resolved. On a more personal note, it has been an honor for me to be received in the country on many occasions, in Kazakhstan, I mean, and of course to have received from His Excellency the First President his prize for the nuclear weapon free world and global security. I'm also delighted to speak at the School of Oriental and African Studies. SPAS has, been, has done so much over the years to promote understanding and dialogue. And I wish to thank Dr. Plesh for facilitating today's event, which is very much within this proud tradition. We are commemorating many important anniversaries, and uh, some of uh, you have already mentioned this this year. It is 75 years since the first time that atoms of plutonium were squeezed together with enough density and pressure to create a destructive force which before and could only be generated by nature itself. We also 75 years from the terrible devastation unleashed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which resulted directly from the first test. Yet that same year also saw a pivot towards peace and cooperation between nations. The bloodiest war in history came to an end and the United Nations was established to provide an alternative to war and to promote social progress and fundamental human rights. But what of this year, 2020, while now peoples and governments reel from the chaos and suffering caused by COVID-19, Will historians also record 
the pivot towards cooperation and collaboration? That's the question we should ask ourselves. It is my hope that the pandemic will become a watershed moment for multilateralism. Pandemics, climate change, hunger, and indeed nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, all of these are problems that reach across boundaries and require science-based shared responses. I understand if this seems too optimistic of an outlook for some, but it is no secret that international relations are heavy with tension. Finding a common ground has been difficult, in part due to hardening national security interests. But if we are ever to advance our shared objective of a world of peace, security, prosperity, we need to invest our effort and resources in building the case for multilateralism. So what is the good news? The good news is that from climate change action to international development to arms control, many of these multilateral structures already exist. The more difficult part is making sure that they stay protected and nurtured. And this is exactly what's happening to the CTBT itself. But let's take the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, for instance. The treaty and its system of safeguards have ensured the continued availability of nuclear power for those who want it while reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation. Nonetheless, the international nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime has come under considerable stress in recent years. And this is due to a perceived lack of implementation of disarmament commitment by some states. Other states remain concerned about the ability of the NPT to adapt along with evolving proliferation risks. The NPT, however, remains one of the most adhered to treaties and continue to provide a forum for cooperation and debate on the collective goals of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. State parties to the NPT will meet in January for the 10th NPT Review Conference, which will mark the 50th anniversary of its entry into force. Whatever criticism, the very fact that the nearly 200 parties to the NPT continue to discuss and debate the most effective collective measures that can be undertaken to meet the objective of the nuclear non-proliferation is testament to the endurance of the multilateral approach. I only hope that a truly successful outcome will put us on track to realize each one of the NPT's pillars. In my view, what those of us seeking a nuclear uh, weapon-free world can learn from the, uh, learn the current pandemic is the importance of science and policy nexus. Right now, it is too early to judge the successes and failures of COVID response. But one thing is clear, if we are to prevent and adequately respond to similar events in future, we need more scientific cooperation and science diplomacy than ever before. And we also need a greater public understanding of science. This should be where we pivot towards. For the past several decades, the use of scientific expertise to further diplomacy has achieved notable successes in advancing peace and security. Science can demonstrate that technical solutions to shared problems are possible. This enables diplomats and other policymakers to build the political will needed to make those solutions a reality. There are plenty of great examples. One of the greatest examples has been the verification regime of the CTBT, drawn up largely at the time when the political will for the test ban treaty 
had not yet crystallized. It is a solid, trustworthy tool that provides assurances to all that no country can conduct nuclear explosive testing. Despite this, and this was mentioned by my dear friend and deputy minister, the CTBT is still not in force. It is worth repeating that no path to a world without nuclear weapon is viable without a in force comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. There is plenty of scope for using scientific cooperation in future to help build the basis for multilateralism. As leaders, we all need to think about how we can counteract short-termism and further boost the role of science and the role, the, science, the role science can play in solving problems that affect us all. In our view, a key main contribution we can make is through the public promotion of science and investment into science, the communication of scientific approaches to problem solving, and above all, fostering access to science and technology education and training among the widest number of people as possible. At the CTBTO, we are doing what we can to advocate for the role of science in policy making. Our biennial science and technology conferences and our science diplomacy symposiums are important contribution to that. So too is our capacity building work with government and institution in developing countries, as well as our intergenerational outreach, the CTBT Youth Group, well supported by Kazakhstan not only by the first president of Kazakhstan, but also by the president, President Kasim Dumar Tokayev, who has been a strong advocate of the CTBT Youth Group as well. Let me close by thanking you all for participating in this event today. I look forward to a lively discussion with many different viewpoints to be expressed. Let us recall that we, that we determine our own future gloomy prediction of the demise of multilateralism abound now, but so have they done before. As we emerge from the shadow of COVID, let us all commit to strengthening the global non-testing norm, to bringing the CTBT into force, to furthering the full implementation of the non-proliferation treaty, and to leveraging science to address the global challenges we face as we seek to finally rid the world of nuclear weapons. We count as well on our champions of the nuclear test-free world, First President Nazarbayev and Her Excellency President Alolan from Finland, from Finland. We're counting on them and we're counting on all of you to get this world rid of nuclear testing and prepare for the world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucina, for your uh, excellent remarks uh, and uh, 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 for your continued efforts to uh, uh, bring into force the uh, CTBT. We all know uh, uh, those countries on uh, whose uh, position uh, this uh, very important uh, aspect is uh, dependent, and uh, we uh, would encourage you to uh, continue with your efforts uh, to. Uh, make sure that uh, CTBT as an important element of the uh, nuclear free world is in force, in full force. Thank you also for highlighting uh, the importance of the nexus of uh, uh, politicians, uh, public uh, awareness and science, most importantly in addressing this uh, uh, global challenge. Let me, <coughs> excuse me, let me now give the floor to uh, our next speaker, uh, um, uh, uh, Ambassador Aidan Lidl, uh, he has a, a distinguished career in uh, the Foreign Office. Uh, he was posted in uh, Stockholm, Islamabad, and Brussels, and uh, since July uh, 2018, he is uh, the permanent representative of the United Kingdom at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Of course, UK as a P5 member uh, has a great role to play uh, to achieve our noble goal, and. Uh, I uh, uh, would uh, welcome uh, Ambassador Little to uh, share with us his thoughts. 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ambassador, and, and to your colleagues at the uh, Embassy of Kazakhstan in London for organising this, and indeed to our friends at SOAS uh, for, uh, for this uh, important event. Um, thank you also, Ambassador, for telling me that my name is, uh, is, is, is Kazakh. Um, I, my parents always told me it was Irish, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, an example of cross-cultural cooperation, perhaps, that it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a recognized name in both. Um, it's a particular pleasure to, to, to speak on this, uh, on this very distinguished panel. Um, I regret that I'm going to have to disappear just before four o'clock because one of the things that this COVID hybrid world allows us to do is to be in many places at once. So after I've spoken to this event in London, uh, from here in Geneva, I'll be chairing a meeting in New York uh, on an initiative we're taking on uh, outer space security at the, uh, the UN General Assembly. So uh, apologies, but I won't be able to, um, uh, to stay for the discussion. But if there are any questions um, specifically for me, then please do direct them via Dan uh, to, uh, to, to me, and I'd be very happy to, uh, to, to get back to, uh, back, back to you afterwards. Um, it's also a particular pleasure um, to, uh, to share a stage virtually with uh, uh, Deputy Minister Ashik Bayev. Um, I had the honour of introducing him to the conference on disarmament last year uh, when I was presiding over the conference uh, when he came to the high level segment. So it's a pleasure to uh, share a, a, a podium with you, albeit virtually again, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, it's also, um, I, I find it uh, always very intimidating to follow Dr. Zerbo, whose uh, um, optimism uh, is, is, is infectious and inspiring, um, and I think is, uh, is, is something we can all. Uh, we can all benefit from. Um, so, so thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Zobo, for, for that. Um, it's, it's of course true that COVID-19 has, has turned the world upside down. We've all, uh, we've all recognized that. But it's my personal view that what the pandemic has done is not to perhaps bring in any fundamental changes. Human beings, after all, are adaptable and uh, resilient creatures. Um, but what, it, what I think it has done is to accelerate and to exacerbate trends which perhaps are already going, uh, or already, already running. Um, uh, webinars is, is one of them. I think uh, traditionally I would have flown back to London for this, but uh, I don't have to, and probably in the future uh, that, that sort of, uh, this sort of mode of, of discussion will stay, and, and probably for the better. Um, Dr. Zerbo asked if this was going to be the watershed then of, of, uh, of, of changes, and I think what the pandemic does um, in our sphere is to highlight both how we need to work together to solve common problems, but also I think how that um, understanding, that, re that realization also pulls against narrow national interests. And we've seen in the response to the pandemic, how uh, I think there's been a general recognition that we all need to work together to coordinate our responses, to use multilateral uh, institutions and to ensure that multilaterally we, we are prepared for uh, for these sorts of crises but also how the response to these sorts of crises also engages very um, parochial uh, interests um, and how difficult it is I think to uh, to to promote multilateral cooperation over those parochial instincts uh, in what is I think widely recognized to be a very low trust uh, international environment at the moment um, so in that, I think I'll probably bridge the pessimism that uh, Dan uh, articulated at the beginning, perhaps with, uh, perhaps with Dr. Zerbo's optimism. Um, the other thing it would highlight, and I, I don't need to go into this in detail because Dr. Zerbo has already covered it, but I think this, this pandemic does highlight the importance of having, ex, uh, having access to, to, to scientific expertise in the multilateral sphere. We had a really good conversation this morning in the conference on disarmament about emerging technologies uh, and, and the the point was made there that, um, that we really can't have meaningful conversations on how to create multilateral responses to these challenges without really robust um, independent scientific expertise. Um, but uh, Dr. Zerbo uh, made that point more, more eloquently than I can. So I, I think these, uh, these points um, are, are valid for, for the whole multilateral environment. We obviously see it, see it with the, 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 the global public health system, but um, I, th I think these, these, these things are also true in multilateral nuclear disarmament. The context is, as I say, one of low trust and heightened tensions. I think that's, that's undeniable. Um, and I think while the world uh, recommits itself regularly to a world without nuclear weapons, um, and to the multilateral process for getting to that world without nuclear weapons, 
it's often the lack of trust in the context. It's some, sometimes the sort of parochial uh, interests that, uh, that, that, that stop us getting there. So what is the impact of the, of the pandemic on the, on the, on the, the multilateral nuclear disarmament um, field? I think it's, again, it's, it's more of the same. It's, it's probably exacerbated some of the tensions. It's probably exacerbated some of the lack of trust, but it's also underlined that really there is no other way uh, to, to, to get there. Um, being a diplomat, I have to talk a bit about process as well. Of course, one of the other um, major impacts of the, or the most immediate impact really of the pandemic on our, our particular part of the multilateral jungle is the fact that we haven't been able to meet uh, for our um, 10th review conference, which was supposed to be in April, uh, May this year. Um, uh, we hope indeed it will happen in January, but I don't think anybody is, is, is laying major bets on that happening. Uh, the pandemic is still very much in, uh, in, in full swing in many parts of the world. And uh, having such a, such a big international gathering in New York at the moment seems almost unimaginable, but we have to imagine it and we have to work towards it because there really is no other way of, uh, of, of, of making progress. So I think with, 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 the, with, with the sort of global, um, uh, the global context uh, being the way it is, uh, and the, uh, the difficulties in terms of diplomatic process in making progress on multilateral disarmament uh, in, in the current circumstances, um, the outlook is, is frankly not good. Um, but I think it's incumbent on all of us uh, to, to do what we can, uh, not only to keep the, uh, keep the conversation going in these difficult circumstances and to keep working towards our common goal, um, but to find new and creative ways uh, of doing so in the current circumstances. Um, of course, we are meeting under the aegis of the Embassy of Kazakhstan, and Kazakhstan has been one of those countries uh, who has really risen to that challenge over the years. We've, we've heard about Kazakhstan's record in championing the Comprehensive uh, Test Ban Treaty. Um, I'm also very uh, appreciative of their role in, uh, in, in promoting the uh, concept of nuclear weapon-free zones, um, and indeed in, in uh, collaboration between nuclear weapon free zones which I think is a very important practical effort and it's those sorts of important practical efforts that we really need to be prioritizing at the moment. Um, so with all that said uh, just a, a few words to close about what the UK is, is doing in, in, in these circumstances. Um, as I say our, our fundamental position hasn't changed. We are committed to a world without nuclear weapons um, we are convinced that that world is possible and, and necessary but we are also convinced that that world must be a safer world than the one we have at the moment. We can't just go back to the world as it existed just before nuclear weapons um, uh, came upon us in the 1940s. Uh, that world wasn't a particularly safe world as we found to our cost, um, even using conventional means um, uh, before, before August 1945. That's why we're absolutely convinced the step-by-step -step approach to nuclear disarmament is the only viable way. Um, the test ban it was a hugely important part of that um, and its entry into force is an absolutely vital uh, step along the, the road to a world without nuclear weapons and it's I think it's true to say that such a world is, is, is inconceivable without a without a, a, an enforced an enforceable and verifiable ban and it's, it's credit to the um, uh, to the uh, to the um, uh, the work of the executive secretary that the CTPTO is working so hard to bring that uh, that to, to fruition and we're, we're a great champion of that work as well of course in Vienna. Um, but um, moving beyond the comprehensive test ban what more can we do? Um, again the UK has been a champion for many years of uh, a fissile material cutoff treaty. Uh, we need a, a, an internationally legally binding regime to manage uh, to manage fissile material both in nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states and that's an incredibly important uh, um, objective that we're still we're still working hard on. Um, we have been particularly involved in recent years in efforts on verification because um, a nuclear weapon free world without really robust verification regimes is, is, is certainly not going to be any safer and probably more dangerous than it is now. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very important uh, um, strand of work to come up with, uh, with, with, with robust uh, technique, credible techniques for verifying the absence of nuclear weapons and the dismantlement of nuclear weapons as part of the underpinning of a nuclear weapon free world. This is another area where scientific expertise is absolutely vital. It's one thing for diplomats like me to, uh, 
uh, to make these points in, in, in multilateral fora, but without the work of, uh, of our experts at the Atomic Weapons Establishment at Aldermaston and many other experts around the world on these techniques and, and uh, questions, uh, we're not going to get anywhere near the world that we, that we need to see. Um, the other thing I think that we've been championing over the last few years is, is transparency. I know that's, it, it's an incredibly important um, uh, aspect of this because, again, a world without nuclear weapons has to be an incredibly transparent world, and verification is, is part of that. Transparency is one of the underpinning principles uh, of nuclear disarmament, um, and it's something that, we, uh, that we, 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 we've taken very seriously over the years. Um, we have uh, very high levels of transparency, not only on our own capabilities, our numbers of warheads, our posture, uh, but also on our doctrine. Uh, and at the moment, of course, we're going through an integrated review, uh, which will be looking at our nuclear doctrine once more. Um, it's starting from the premise that we will retain our nuclear deterrent for as long as the security situation demands it. But it gives us the opportunity to look again at our posture, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, recalibrate our, um, our, our approach to minimum credible deterrence, which is very important to us, uh, and also to review things like our, our negative security assurances, which again, I know are, are, are greatly important of great importance to many to many states. Um, so the approach we've taken to transparency, and particularly with our national implementation report to the 10th Review Conference, uh, I, I think is an important contribution. Um, we've also been, of course, the, the, the coordinator of the P5 process over the last few years. Uh, I won't go into more detail now about what we've done in that. I've, I've done that elsewhere, but uh, um, having keeping that cooperation going amongst the P5, even whilst uh, tensions are so high and relations are so difficult in some cases, is an incredibly important signal, uh, I think, not just to the world in, in, in terms of our seriousness about nuclear disarmament and, and uh, maintaining strategic stability, um, but also of, 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 of really practical import um, to um, reducing tensions and reducing nuclear risks between us. Um, to conclude then, I, I, I think I would just say that what the pandemic has done is to reinforce our conviction uh, that a nuclear weapon-free world um, is, uh, still an absolutely fundamental goal of our foreign policy um, and of our, our, our destiny as a, as a global community. But it's also, it, it, it underpinned that, that we can only do this working together. We can only do this in a, in a properly comprehensive multilateral way, um, engaging with the world as it is, not as we want it to be. And I think what the pandemic has shown that is, is that um, things that are worthwhile are also very, very difficult. Uh, nuclear disarmament is only one of those problems. Uh, it's been a problem for 75 years or more, and it will it will continue to be a problem uh, for many years in the future. But it's only a problem that we'll be able to tackle uh, if we if we work together, if we uh, seek the right advice, uh, if we approach each other's positions and problems with respect, um, and, uh, and 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 come up with new creative ways of of, of approaching old problems. So with that, I, uh, I, I say I regret that I can't stay on for the discussion because I'm sure it will come up with a lot of these uh, these issues. But I look forward to uh, I look forward to working with all of you to achieve that goal. Thank you. For, uh, Ambassador, thank you very very much for those uh, uh, very very interesting remarks. Uh, it's my uh, uh, my great pleasure to I'm afraid not call upon Cardinal Peter Turkson, who is. I think I'm in Ghanaian airspace at this moment and had hoped to be with us. Uh, but um, his, his colleague, um, uh, who uh, leads uh, work in integrated human uh, development on disarmament um, in the Dicastri of the Vatican, uh, Dr. Uh, Alessio, who I think is, uh, is with us and should be able to, to join us now, I hope. Uh, Alessio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Plesh. <laughs> I'm going to read a message from His Eminence Cardinal Peter uh, Tarkson. Uh, Your Excellencies, esteemed professors, prestigious speakers, dear friends, I would like to thank you, the Center for International uh, uh, Studies and Diplomacy and the Embassy of Kazakhstan in the United States for inviting me to this prestigious event. Um, at first, I would like to support the call against nuclear tests on 29 of August, we celebrate the International Day Against Nuclear Tests and the closure of the semi paratisk nuclear test site in 1991 is one of the most powerful symbols of the overall testimony process. Nuclear test victims are estimated to be more than 2.4 billion in the world. I would like to send my prayers to their families. 
Their testimony recalls us that, as Pope Francis underlines, nuclear weapons are a global problem affecting all nations and impacting future generations and the planet that is our own. It is with this conviction that the ODC ratified the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and more recently, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The ODC firmly believes that these treaties are vital pieces in the nuclear disarmament architecture and complement one another toward achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Kazakh history shows that proliferation is not a one-way street. As known, after hosting more than 1,400 1, uh, Soviet strategic nuclear warheads on its territory, Kazakhstan has become a leading country in the field of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, whose greatest result is maybe the creation of the nuclear weapon free zone in Central Asia. This must be acknowledged and supported by political leaders, national and international institutions. By echoing the strong position of Pope Francis against nuclear weapons, my second call will be against the so-called doctrine of deterrence. How can we speak of peace even as we build terrifying new weapons of war? As the Pope says, nuclear deterrence and the threat of mutual assured destruction cannot be, cannot be the basis for an ethics of fraternity and peaceful coexistence. Pope Francis has also observed that until recently, arts control, control policies were mainly handled by interstate diplomacy or by international accords. Today, we're witnessing a growing awareness that each individual person and all people collectively are involved in arms control. Thus, humanitarian disarmament movement is born, which is spearheaded by civil society groups with memberships spanning the globe and which is a people-centered approach to disarmament. On its part, our dicastery intends to continue its dialogue on disarmament, centering it with the broader context of integral peace building. The latter, according to St. Pope John XXIII, does not only refer to state armaments, rather it calls on every person to disarm his or her own part and to be a peacemaker everywhere. Integral disarmament takes us beyond the mentality of finding security only in armament and the readiness for war and nurtures a culture of encounter for a civil gesture of love. It aims at developing the whole person for all people that cares deeply about God's creation in its totality. To achieve integral disarmament, it is however necessary to break the whole logic of deterrence being it nuclear or conventional. For this reason, I welcome the UN Security Council recent endorsement for a of a global ceasefire. But one thing is to call or endorse a ceasefire statement, another thing is to implement it. In order to do so, we need to freeze weapons production and dealing. Thus, the dicastery would like to reaffirm its strong support in favor of the freeze campaign. <clears throat> How can we face the health and climate crisis if our investments are directed towards military production? The Stockholm International Peace <coughs> Service continues increases in military spending, 1.9 trillion US dollars only in 2019. Even in the midst of global health crisis, some decision makers are urging an increase in military spending. Increased military investments do not only reflect the increase in the, in the tension between nations, but by feeding the so-called security dilemma, they generate and reinforce them. In conclusion, global, issue, global issues require global solutions. In face of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, Pope Francis is calling for a global, globalization of solidarity based on multilateral cooperation. For this reason, once again, I welcome the decision of SOS University not only to commemorate the International Day Against Nuclear Tests, but also to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The United Nations constitutes a space for dialogue and peaceful resolution, resolution of conflicts that is unprecedented in human history. They are the pillar of multilateralism. However, the concept of globalization of solidarity goes beyond, beyond the multilateralism even if it's so strongly needed today. 
Not only it refers to state level, but includes communities and individuals and they respond to the desire of human beings to feel rooted with their community in the whole humanity, to build bridges, keep dialogue, open and continue to meet with one another. We should still fight to give peace a chance. In the spirit of the UN founders, uh, that in the aftermath of World War II had the courage to find innovative solutions to secure our common future. We must now pursue their force and with the help of the United Nations campaign to give a chance to nuclear weapons free war. Thank you. Alessio, thank you very much for, your, uh, 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 for being with us today and uh, uh, please uh, send uh, our warmest regards to Cardinal Peter Turkson uh, and uh, wish him well in his uh, African trip. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, uh, therefore I uh, go straight uh, to Lord Haney. Of course, Lord Haney has uh, uh, the most distinguished political and uh, diplomatic career. Uh, he served, uh, uh, took uh, uh, many uh, uh, important diplomatic positions, uh, including being Minister of the British Embassy in Washington. Then he was uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the European uh, Economic Community, but most importantly, for, for five years, uh, Lord Haney was uh, uh, UK's permanent representative to the United Nations. It was exactly the time when Kazakhstan uh, became the member uh, of the uh, United Nations in 1992. Today, uh, Lord Haney uh, uh, keeps a very active uh, uh, role um, on the matter we are discussing today. Uh, he is uh, a co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global Security and Non-Proliferation, as well as he is the chair of the All Party Group for the United Nations of, uh, uh, of Westminster. He is also a member of the top level group for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation and a member of the Lords International Committee. Therefore, Lord Haney, uh, who knows uh, uh, a thing or two about uh, the matter under discussion, uh, I have the great pleasure and honor to give the floor to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, very much for that. Um, I think the question posed to all contributors to this uh, webinar, whether post-COVID uh, multilateral cooperation offers a chance to achieve a nuclear weapons-free world. Uh, that question, in my view, uh, is best responded to in very general terms uh, by quoting that often cited, but in my view, rather wise Chinese saying, the longest journey begins with the first step, because it will be a long journey. There really is no doubt about that if we are to achieve global zero. There aren't any shortcuts available, even if, uh, as is very possible, uh, what is known as the Ban Treaty enters into force uh, among its signatories fairly soon, because those signatories don't include any of the states uh, which currently possess nuclear weapons. And none of those states has shown any interest in signing up. So I doubt myself if there is a viable uh, alternative to what I would describe as an incremental approach um, to, the, to nuclear disarmament, which is, of course, why multilateral cooperation is so fundamentally important, because that's the only way to achieve that kind of incremental progress. So you will reasonably ask, what is that first step? Uh, one that I would have no hesitation in answering, that it, that it, it currently must be the extension of the US-Russian New START Treaty on Strategic Weapons, which, if not extended, will lapse in February 2021. If that were to happen, there would be no cap on number of strategic weapons in the arsenals of the two largest nuclear weapon powers, and the mutual surveillance and monitoring provisions of New START would be lost too. Uh, Add to that, of course, the fact that this is the last remaining uh, serious arms control treaty between those two nuclear states. So while we need to recognize and to respect the fact that New START is a bilateral treaty, we're not parties to it, no one else is except the US and Russia, 
And we need to, to avoid being drawn into the US presidential election campaign. That goes without saying. It is nevertheless, I think, very important that all those friends and allies of those two states express clearly their hope that agreement will be reached to extend that particular treaty. And there I uh, salute, frankly, uh, the contribution of the Deputy Minister of Kazakhstan to our webinar today when he expressed that view in the name of his government. I think that was extraordinarily helpful. Um, talks between the two parties, as we know, are continuing, ongoing. There have been a couple of sessions recently in Vienna. So it is not too late for such expressions of view by governments and by parliamentarians to have some influence. Now, much concern is expressed about the position of China, whose nuclear arsenal and policies remain cloaked in a good deal of obscurity. Again, addressing this will necessarily be a long journey. But an important first step would be to engage a serious dialogue about strategic stability and nuclear risk reduction between the P5. Uh, agreement in principle to do this was registered when the P5 met at Deputy Minister level in London this last February. The first discussion was to have taken place in the margins of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Review Conference last April. But that conference was postponed, as we've heard already this afternoon, because of COVID-19, until next year. That discussion, that dialogue amongst the P5, really needs to be engaged at that occasion. And that conference, too, will need to uh, consider whether there are more promising ways than can be found for handling the nuclear programs of North Korea and Iran, both of which pose existential threats to the non-proliferation treaty uh, regime, which remains a cornerstone of international peace and security. In neither case, uh, the, in neither case can we say that the current discord and stasis offer a promising way forward. In the case of Iran, it becomes steadily more urgent to look again at the sunset provisions of the original JCPOA, and also not to lose sight of the overall objective, which we really do need to keep in our, uh, on the horizon of making progress towards a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Now, it's tempting to feel despondent uh, several previous speakers to myself have expressed varying degrees of despondency about the prospects for multilateral nuclear disarmament uh, as the original steps in that direction are reversed or ignored. And I understand that despondency. But tempting though it is, I believe it is premature to despond. What is sure is that if we allow despondency to triumph, then we will find ourselves living in a great deal less secure world, even than the one we live in now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for those very profound remarks. Um, thank you indeed. So uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, uh, call upon Kate Hudson, who is General Secretary of the British campaign for nuclear disarmament. Kate. Um, oh, not the, is Kate, are you with us still? Sorry. Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Okay, well, over to you then. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express our sincere thanks for the organization of this important discussion. It will be very helpful in developing crucial strategic thought at a time when many certainties have been undermined. and The possibility of new thinking is on the agenda, at least for a time. 
Today, our world is facing a number of severe interlocking crises, which make nuclear use more likely and make international cooperation more vital than ever. These crises expedite the degradation and destruction of human life, our health, the environment, and the natural world, and indeed the future of our planet. If any good can come out of the tragedy of the pandemic, it is surely that it has provoked so many to say there can be no going back to how things were, that we need to build back better. There is an opportunity to do things differently, but this requires sustained commitment and determination by enormous forces, by states and by people. From our perspective, nuclear disarmament must be part of the rethinking. Earlier this year, the hands of the doomsday clock were set at 100 seconds to midnight, closer than they have ever been to catastrophe, even at the height of the Cold War. This must be a call to action for all. In this context, the initiative of the UN Secretary General to call for a global ceasefire was an important example of how the international community could work in Britain, as in many other countries, the pandemic has exposed the disastrous failure of government policy, which sees security in terms of the capacity to kill, and which sees national status in terms of possession of weapons of mass destruction. This remains the primary reason for British possession of nuclear weapons, to secure us a seat at the so-called top table of global power politics. But our politicians have failed to make us secure. For some years, pandemics have been designated as tier one threats to our security. Successive national security risk assessments have rightly identified such human health crises as worthy of the highest level of concern and planning. So why was Britain unprepared for the coronavirus with insufficient equipment, staff and infrastructure? to serve its people. We don't have to look far to see what has gone wrong. The last two security strategies have designated the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation and use as a tier two threat below that of pandemics. Yet the governments that produced these risk assessments chose to pour vast sums into a new nuclear weapons system to meet this lower level threat. At the same time, our health system was left chronically underfunded by years of austerity cuts and rendered unable to meet the challenge of a pandemic. But the pandemic has also shown us what is possible. As the virus hit hard in the early stages of the lockdown, government urged rapid changes in industrial production. Many companies, including those that make parts of the UK's Trident nuclear weapons system, switch to making ventilators, protective visors, and other health equipment. We want to work to ensure that production for public good is made permanent. And no doubt, there are many examples on the international scale. Yet at the same time as opportunities exist, we're also facing an increasingly dangerous military situation driven most alarmingly by US policies. Withdrawal from key nuclear reduction and control treaties and the possibility of the resumption of nuclear testing all increase the risk of nuclear war. The US national security strategy has had a disturbing orientation towards conflict with China and Russia. And its most recent nuclear posture review referred to so-called usable nuclear weapons. These are now produced and deployed. Taking these developments together shows how important our efforts towards a nuclear weapons free world really are. In this context, it is profoundly to be welcomed that ratifications of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons are steadily mounting towards the 50 required to bring it into force. This will be a very important development which shows courageous leadership from those states
that champion the treaty. For us in the UK, we face a huge challenge. Our government is opposed to the treaty and an enormous effort is required to make the treaty impact on the nuclear weapons states. Mass pressure from citizens is crucial to bring change. We need popular mobilization, especially in the context of the pandemic, where resources need to move from military expenditure to meeting human need. New arguments are now possible while minds are open in new ways. And it must be done. To ensure our survival, humanity must come together, organize and cooperate on a global scale never seen before. The chance is there. We must act together to make it happen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kate, for your very uh, enthusiastic and emotional uh, uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I uh, want now to invite our uh, Pagos uh, chairman uh, from Kazakhstan and uh, from uh, the United Kingdom. First, uh, the floor goes to Dr. Skolnik. As I said, he is a nuclear physicist by his uh, uh, background and education. Uh, he knows uh, uh, the matter uh, under discussion uh, uh, quite uh, profusely. Therefore, uh, Vladimir Sergeyevich, uh, you have the floor. Thank you a lot. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the possibility to be here. Uh, I would like to emphasize what uh, the Pogos Committee of Republic of Kazakhstan was established in 2017. It brought together the leading scientists and specialists of the Republic who are not indifferent to security of our future. We are making every possible effort to prevent the use of scientific and technological developments, development of weapons of mass destruction to reduce the global level of tension and risk associated with such weapons. Uh, our scientists actively supported and took part in activities to create a nuclear weapon free zone in Central Asia alongside works on improving the method and applying IA safeguards to the, to the nuclear activities of Kazakhstan enterprises to ensure safety in the handling of various weapon-grade nuclear materials, including spent fuel fast breeder reactor B350. Uh, research reactors in national nuclear center are being converted to low energy nuclear fuel. A similar project has been completed in the Institute of Nuclear Physics in Almaty. The International Law Enrichment Uranium Bank was established in Kazakhstan, where IAS nuclear materials is located now. Uh, it's obvious that our work is proceeding in close cooperation with colleagues from other countries who adhere to the same views. Exchange of experience, ideas, joint actions, all these are integral attributes of the Pogosh movement. Of course, the spread of the pandemic makes its own adjustment in the form of our cooperation. But today's webinar illustrates well the possibility of online work. In addition to technical issues, we pay great attention to creating a legal framework for the containment of nuclear weapons and nuclear design. Kazakhstan signed the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty in 2018. We understand that without the participation of the nuclear weapon states, the treaty will have limited effect. But the important things is uh, that this treaty uh, clearly outlaw nuclear weapons. After its entry into force legal speculation, it will be impossible to justify the uh, threat of the use of such weapons by anyone. In this aspect, it was mentioned the ambiguous provision of paragraph 4 uh, of Article 4 of International Convention 
for suppression of act of nuclear terrorism, where the uh, legality of the use of nuclear weapon by states can be lately assumed. Unfortunately, there is still no progress on the development of treaty banning of uh, production of fissile uh, materials for nuclear weapons and nuclear explosive devices, which would become an effective component of international legal system for Cuban the proliferation of nuclear weapons and would contribute to the nuclear disarmament. It seems that the uh, Pogosh movement can contribute to the promotion of both this treaty and the improvement of other legal instruments in the field of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Thus, improving the international legal infrastructure can be an important area of work uh, in the post-pandemic period. Such question of whether to wait for the right moment to end the existence of a nuclear weapon has an unambiguous answer. Of course not. The work must continue and all efforts of honest scientists and specialists must be aimed at preventing further Escalation the global risk associated with the presence of improvement of weapon of mass destruction, regardless of the official policy of the states. In addition, uh, scientists can be should contribute to the development of peaceful use of atomic energy and apl application of civil properties. It's important to note that the Republic of Kazakhstan contributes uh, the development of nuclear power technologies. The country is carrying out research work aimed of improving the safety of nuclear energy facilities. Experimental studies are being carried out, the results of which form the basis of safe and economical projects of new generation nuclear reactors. In Kazakhstan, a project being implemented to create uh, a material science tokamak, PTM, in support of the program for creating an international thermonuclear experimental reactor, ITR. It's a world's first uh, specialized tokamak designed to test uh, the functional and structural materials for future uh, thermonuclear power engineering. Uh, to conclude, I believe that expanding international collaboration in this area is a, is a feasible and promising task for uh, Despite temporary difficulties, work to strengthen international relations continues, continues, and active work of the Pogosh Committee of Kazakhstan brings its results in the form expanding interaction between scientists, which in turn leads the, uh, to the initiation of implementation of new joint scientific project, obtaining science results which are significant to science worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Um, and it's great to, to be interacting with, uh, with Pugwash again, which I've been involved with for uh, many years. Um, and it's uh, Great pleasure to now call on uh, Ambassador Peter Jenkins, our last uh, uh, contributor here from the, uh, the British end of, uh, of Bugwash. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we can uh, uh, continue to run about four o'clock and uh, we'll have an opportunity to take in some of the questions that have, have come in. So over to you, Peter. Mike, Peter. Do that for me. Now I'm in trouble. Oh, it's okay now. Has someone done it for me? Yes, it's been done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Excellency. Um, the November US presidential and congressional elections seem to me more likely to make a difference to the outlook for nuclear arms control and disarmament than the COVID-19 pandemic. The election of former Vice President Biden can lead to a revival of US interest in nuclear arms control. 
a democratic majority in the Senate and House could possibly lead to a scaling back of plans to modernize and renew the US nuclear triad. Although the US nuclear weapons industry due to benefit from colossal federal spending on modernization and renewal will try hard to thwart any scaling back. A formulation I have just used is perhaps misleading. It implies that the Trump administration has had no interest in nuclear arms control. That is not quite true. Uh, they have not excluded an extension to New START, which will expire in February 2021. But for long, they set a condition, Chinese accession to the extension negotiation, which was not within the realm of probability. They have now dropped that condition, but they have set new conditions. They want Russia to agree to expand New START to include limits on all types of nuclear warhead and to alter the treaty's verification regime. These conditions will be an obstacle to extension to judge from what Russian Deputy Minister Rebkov told reporters on 18 August. I have been talking about nuclear arms control because alas, I think this is the most for which we who want to see the world rid of nuclear weapons can hope at this stage. I cannot think of a single state possessing nuclear weapons that has been showing signs of willingness to give up weapons which are perceived as providing status and prestige in addition to a deterrence capability. To my mind, this situation calls for the non-nuclear weapon states to bring pressure to bear on the five NPT nuclear weapon states, bilaterally and multilaterally, at the 2021 NPT Review Conference and in UN fora, because collective pressure is harder to ignore than bilateral pressure. The obvious priority is to get the United States and Russia to agree to an extension of New START and a negotiation on a successor agreement embracing all types of nuclear warhead. Thereafter, I suggest a focus on reducing the risk that any of the five's roughly 3,500 deployed nuclear warheads will ever be used by urging all five to commit to no first use which in turn would entail the United States abandoning an escalation to de-escalate doctrine and Russia abandoning doctrinal provision for the use of tactical nuclear weapons to compensate for perceived conventional inferiorities. The abandonment of hair trigger alert postures and agreement to refrain from placing in space weapons which threaten the survival of space-based early warning and communication systems would also be valuable. To many of us who want a world free of nuclear weapons, this will probably seem a very modest agenda. I suggest though that we must think of ourselves as passengers on a ship bound for a promised land that first suffered a loss of power and on which now a fire has broken out. We must come together to put out the fire as quickly as possible with every intention once the fire is out of finding a way to restore full power to the propulsion gear. Thank you. Imagery to conclude your remarks. Yeah. Your Excellency, I think we have a, a few questions um, that have come in. Um, I can perhaps respond to a couple of them verbally. You and your team may want to, uh, and I'm sure there may be, want to be some discussion amongst, uh, amongst the, the panelists. Uh, one, uh, one question related to uh, the relative damage of uh, COVID, which is global, and nuclear weapons, which are, uh, could be thought of individually is just taking a, a local, having a local impact. 
Um, and I think I have to disagree with that, although, of course, uh, uh, COVID today uh, accounts for getting on for a million deaths, but no one knows precisely. But that, uh, that death toll could come about in a single major city from a single uh, significant uh, hydrogen bomb, for example, on central London. The, the prompt deaths uh, and the not so prompt deaths from such an explosion uh, would be in the order of a million out of uh, some eight million in the greater London area. So uh, without uh, wanting to uh, compete over uh, the, the numbers of the dead, which is a, a gruesome and, um, uh, and foolish task, um, I think the, the global impact of the pandemic, which is still unfortunately gathering momentum in a number of uh, parts of the world, not least India, um, that uh, compared to the release, uh, the use of nuclear weapons on a major scale, which also would have, as we know from our uh, colleagues in Kazakhstan, a, a devastating multi-generational impact on the civilian population. Uh, and of course it was uh, from nuclear testing uh, back in the 1960s that radiation started to be seen in cow's milk that uh, in a sense produced a global revulsion in public opinion against nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere. So the idea that nuclear weapons are just a, of a local effect uh, is not really scientifically um, accurate. There are one or two other questions that have come in, but uh, Your Excellency, you want me to continue with one or two of them, or do you want to mention yourself? I think uh, our team is sending the questions to your phone. Yes. So uh, you can... Uh... Well, I can, I'll pass on uh, another one to you um, after I've had another quick look here. Um, well, I guess there's one for me here because of US-UK nuclear collaboration, cooperation, um, the cooperation of two countries, and indeed, uh, the United Kingdom has expressed, as I believe, uh, support for the development of a, uh, a small nuclear weapon. They say small, but this is uh, of the order of magnitude of Hiroshima, or a bit smaller, to be uh, fired from submarines, um, which traditionally have been thought of as the, uh, the sort of Damocles, uh, the great threat in the background if war breaks out, and not uh, for... Um, the conduct of uh, so-called tactical small use. And these, I think, are very negative developments. And what's to be done about it? Well, I can only agree with um, Ms. Hudson that uh, public opinion uh, must uh, uh, come to the fore. But sadly, I think our media, uh, in, even in our, uh, the very free West and uh, free Britain, is very poor at informing the public about, uh, about these issues. Um, but I wondered if... Uh, your Excellency had a view on the question of uh, the global impact of uh, nuclear weapons use compared to COVID, and uh, obviously because you have had the experience of this within Kazakhstan. Well, uh, I would uh, rather uh, offer this question to our panelists. Please. Uh, uh, who would like to uh, uh, pick up here and uh, take this question uh, from our distinguished panel? Yes, uh, Peter, please. Do, do I have the floor? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just two words. Um, on the one hand, one could conceive of an attraction in moving from a world um, of 3,500 thermonuclear weapons uh, to a world of, uh, much, of much fewer, but also much less powerful um, atomic weapons or very small thermonuclear weapons because obviously in one sense, um, such the, the smaller weapons would pose less of a threat uh, to the future of mankind and the future of the planet. Um, but on the other hand, it has long been thought that if one makes it uh, less, uh, less terrifying and for, for the future of mankind to use nuclear weapons to initiate a nuclear exchange, uh, then one is increasing the risk uh, that such an exchange will take place. So on balance, my own personal view is that these small, small nuclear weapons are, uh, should be avoided. Thank you. Another question that's come in for the, for the panel uh, relates to the, the denigration of science and the, the role in which uh, media, particularly social media, has accelerated the, the denigration of science at the expense of, well, I guess, superstition, I would say, 
uh, that wasn't the word in the question. And what could we, with our expertise, recommend um, for people to do uh, to, to combat this, uh, in a sense, attack on rationality? And I very welcome any, any contributors to that uh, uh, very important question. Uh, I, shall I say a word? Yes, jump in. Um, I think the need to combat what uh, is known as fake news, um, wrongly known as fake news, because the person who most often uses the word fake news is actually propagating fake news himself, the President of the United States. But uh, I do think that the, um, the all branches of the commentariat of the media have got to fight back. And that means they've got to find ways of bringing to the public's attention the views of scientists, whether it's on nuclear issues, on pandemics or elsewhere, and leave people to judge for themselves uh, whether they want to believe the fake news or whether they want to believe the scientists and those who actually know something about the subject under discussion. I don't think we can duck that. I certainly don't think we can afford to say it's all over, uh, the world is now completely changed, there is no such thing as real news. There's just various brands of uh, propaganda and fake news. That would be a solution of despair. And I don't believe that in a world where, after all, a higher proportion of the population has got a really good degree of education, that this is a lost cause. I think it just takes time and effort and patience. Kate, I see you're keen to get involved. Please do. Well, just a, a quick word about how serious this is. Um, I referred earlier to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, their comments about um, why they'd moved the hands 100 seconds to midnight. And this very fact, um, the denigration of science, the development of fake news and so on, was up there amongst the reasons they gave for those great dangers. Um, but they also identified a, a further element to it, which is the, um, the potential undermining of our democracy um, through fake news and the denigration of science and, and um, indeed the um, undermining of the possibility of nuclear disarmament because uh, people don't know what credit to give to reasoned arguments. You know, so it's, so it's, um, it's bad to have fake news on, on the television and so on, but also the kind of the undermining of the uh, intellectual, um, theoretical and policy um, fabric of our society is, is absolutely crucial as well. So I think we all have a responsibility to seek out um, credible and trustworthy news sources and to interrogate everything that we read, you know, not just to retweet something. This is a, a trap that people fall into, but I think it's something very important that we need to address very seriously. Thank you. Lucina, I think you had uh, a point you wanted to make. Please do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I said both of them had. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Go ahead. It's okay. Yeah, yes, I said bo both of them have uh, uh, raised uh, the point that I wanted to make about uh, uh, denigration of uh, of science. But one thing I want to add is that we have the responsibility ourselves in this field when we talk about uh, this good nexus between science and policy in the field of nuclear disarmament and security, I think we should communicate more ourselves. Those who are involved in this issue at uh, diplomatic level that involves science, uh, missions, you know, the work that Kazakhstan is doing, the scientific work that was done in Kazakhstan to start, for instance, the verification regime of the CTBT, I think there's a lot more communication to be done in that field to allow people to understand where we come from, what, what is the background of the work we do, and then where we want to go. And so it is true that when we, when we go, for instance, to conferences, like I mentioned the NPT, uh, I'm happy to hear today that uh, the path towards nuclear disarmament, the path towards a world free of nuclear weapon goes 
through the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I think many of you have mentioned this. And this is something that we should explain to say why we think this is the way to go. It takes into account not only the step-by-step -step approach, but also the insistence of those who think that nuclear disarmament is not something that is has seen any progress. And then how we can mix those two and then communicate in the best interest of all parties. I think that's something that we should do more and more and then be involved in the debate, not only on Twitter, but also on this type of webinars that we're organizing and that people can follow. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if there are other people who would like to uh, uh, make comments on each other's contributions as we move towards uh, bringing this uh, a very, very interesting afternoon to a close. I would say I think that uh, falsehood propaganda has been around with us really since uh, the beginning of time. Uh, and I always remember in high school being taught uh, that in the Napoleonic era, the bulletins of the uh, French emperor were, gave rise to the expression to lie like a bulletin uh, because of the information coming out of uh, uh, his, his office uh, was seen to be so unreliable. So I don't think we should be uh, caught unawares and think that what we're experiencing is new. I think that although actually through the smartphone, uh, individual human beings have access to unparalleled uh, amounts of information and data. And I guess I, speaking as an educator, our responsibility is to be help people uh, sort out the wheat from the chaff, the intelligence from the nonsense, and to develop those analytical skills, which is why I guess uh, self-serving here, higher education still matters. But uh, with that uh, warm up uh, to you all to think about what any, any final remarks you might like to make. We do have a couple of minutes and Your Excellency, I think should then sum up and, uh, and close our very, very interesting webinar, for which I will just take the opportunity to thank you all for participating in. So the floor is yours, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies. Or we can move towards closure as you wish. Well, uh, I think, I think uh, that uh, we have covered uh, at length uh, and in detail uh, many aspects and concerns. I'd like once again to thank all the panelists uh, for joining us today, uh, expressing their uh, views on, on the matter uh, we are discussing. Uh, we have uh, 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 put uh, the uh, disarmament uh, in the context of the COVID. Uh, and the uh, global response to uh, the pandemic. I think uh, one uh, uh, red line which we heard today uh, is a concern whether uh, uh, the uh, dividing lines will uh, increase or whether we will have wisdom and courage uh, and perseverance to uh, actually uh, hear and respond properly to the cause of uh, uh, non-division. Uh, Lord Haney uh, said uh, about uh, the despondency. I completely agree that uh, we should be uh, very uh, adamant not to allow uh, the feelings of despondency uh, to creep in. Uh, yes, there are very disturbing signs uh, uh, thrown by, by the pandemic that uh, divisions uh, um, are still there. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, Kazakhstan is a small nation. Uh, we are maybe big by size, but uh, we are a, a, a nation of only 18 million people. Uh, we would like to uh, see uh, genuine efforts, uh, global efforts, regional efforts uh, to uh, uh, enhance multilateralism. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, through organizations like Kate's organization, that the public, public voice is made stronger and stronger. Uh, for that matter, uh, 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 Kazakhstan will continue with, with its uh, ATOM project, uh, abolish uh, uh, testing our mission. Uh, we have to uh, bring in scientists uh, with their strong voice. They should not be detached uh, in no way uh, from politicians uh, who make uh, important decisions. Yes, we hear uh, uh, and see uh, what's going on uh, over the other side of the uh, Atlantic. Uh, we see uh, the growing concerns uh, with regard to uh, US-Russia standoff, uh, uh, the uh, um, views on uh, the Chinese growth, uh, but uh, uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, I would like to uh, re-enhance our uh, uh, hope 
that uh, uh, we will uh, not uh, give way uh, to more divisions. And I hope that uh, pandemic uh, and the challenges we face with the pandemic will force us, will encourage us further to come together and uh, 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 address the issues uh, which are on our agenda. First of all, of course, nuclear disarmament is a crucial thing. Uh, this is existential, existential threat. So we have to be uh, absolutely serious about that and uh, uh, join uh, efforts uh, uh, from every corner of the world. I'd like to thank for your uh, enthusiasm, for your sincere feelings and your devotion and dedication to this very important cause. Thank you. You want to add something? Well, I can only reiterate your, your, your remarks. Uh, we are looking to uh, build towards uh, UN Day in October. Uh, with the idea uh, that it is now really the time to, to freeze weapons production across the board. Um, the pressures were there before, um, and I think I've, we can't, I think, carry on this way. And I, I fear that the impact of COVID uh, is, is not over. Um, but uh, talking to friends who are scientists, I think there are many signs that its direct medical and social and political impact are only now uh, uh, gathering momentum, and in a sense, we have had the uh, the volcanic explosion, but the tidal wave has yet to reach us. Um, and I think as that crisis accelerates, then the pressures to reduce conflict and to deal with military expenditure um, are uh, are growing in importance. But I'll be remiss in not uh, uh, thanking um, my colleagues uh, Julia, Arut, Anant, and Ola in putting this whole uh, event together and look forward to working with uh, you all in the future. Thank you so much. I uh, thank you once again. I would like to also uh, say that uh, uh, um, uh, bringing young people, young generation is uh, absolutely important. And I'd like to commend uh, the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy uh, of the SOAS University for doing this. Uh, there is a growing group of uh, young people who are motivated and uh, dedicated to uh, 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 this uh, uh, great challenge. I hope that uh, your center will continue to do this uh, very important work. And uh, I don't think that we have to waste time waiting for the 2021. Uh, we have to prepare the ground now, uh, whether we are still uh, 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 distant uh, from each other by uh, uh, the uh, uh, social distancing, etc. Et but uh, important steps are to be done now. And we have the opportunity given by the technology to uh, uh, work together and uh, uh, make our voices stronger and uh, well heard by the politicians. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, we have a nice uh, afternoon here in London. It's already uh, uh, late evening uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all the participants uh, for, this, uh, uh, for their contributions and uh, we wish you well and uh, we hope that uh, we'll have more and more uh, opportunities to meet with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.